Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago in Exodus chapter 6, the first six verses. Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. As you know, we've been studying the covenant and the land. There are nine different Old Testament covenants, not counting the ones that are mentioned in the New Testament. There are nine covenants, one of which relates to the promise of a specific tract of land that God has given to national Israel. Those who are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes, divided for a period of time during the reign of Rehoboam, but that will come together, all 12 tribes, God guarantees it, in the latter days, in the future of Israel, and he will give to them the extent of the land, a very broad extent that they have never yet experienced in their entire history. Verse 4 of Exodus chapter 6 mentions that covenant. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan the land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. It's a landed covenant that we're looking at, and today we're looking at the sixth part of that. The Old Testament has a, an immense amount of uh, text given to that particular covenant. Many, many verses. It's not merely mentioned in this one verse in Exodus. It's all over the Old Testament in almost every one of the prophetic books of the Old Testament. We find it mentioned in the Psalms. We find it mentioned, of course, in the Pentateuch. We find it mentioned in the various other writings of the Old Testament. For example, the book of Daniel. Uh, we find it mentioned multiple places in the Old Testament. So if you don't know something about this particular covenant, it means you're missing a major part of the Bible. <laughs> this is something that we as believers should know something about. And unfortunately, there are many in so-called churches today that do not believe that God is ever going to keep that promise to Israel. But the Bible says it's true, so if we believe the Bible, then we must believe what it says about the landed covenant. So far we've learned 12 different things about this covenant. Number one, it set the conditions by which national Israel entered into the promised land on the first time. Number two, it set the conditions necessary to remain in the land. Number three, it set the conditions necessarily to ultimately inherit the entire scope from the Euphrates River to the Nile River. Number four, it says that the land is an everlasting possession. Number five, it guarantees that when Israel is expelled because of sin, that God will hold the land in escrow for them until he irresistibly draws them back to the land. Number six, it guarantees that God will bring them back because Jehovah's covenants with Israel cannot be broken. Number seven, the covenant of the land is an unconditional promise that therefore guarantees that Israel will be a nation, not just a people group, will be a nation forever. Number eight, the covenant of the land guarantees that the ultimate fulfillment is totally unconditional. It will be their land, the text says, forever. Number nine, it is a prophetic covenant. Number ten, God always fulfills properly, literally, specifically, naturally, visibly, and physically. Number eleven, because future promises to Israel are prophetic, denial of the literal interpretation of prophecy is an attack on the inspiration of Scripture. That's a very serious indictment, especially those who are in the Reformed tradition who have what they call replacement theology and do not believe that God is going to fulfill it literally. If he does not fulfill literally his promises to Israel, how do you know that he can fulfill literally his promises to you? Number twelve, Believing prophetic truth results, this is very important, it results in holy living. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, that's prophetic truth, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, that is the hope of the prophetic future, the return of Christ, purifieth himself even as he is pure. Last week we also saw that Israel would be cast out of the land because of sin. That's occurred with three times and two restorations thus far. In my devotions this week I ran across another passage and I'd like to have you turn there with me if you will over to 1 Kings chapter 9. 1 Kings chapter 9 and verses 4 through 9. I've read this many times and this was the first time that I had picked up on it. You know you can read the Bible for a very long period of time 
and uh, still see something new when you read it. I've had so many of these exciting wow moments that it's amazing. And um, as you look at the text here in 1 Kings chapter 9, you discover, at least it was for me, another wow moment. Starting in verse 4. This is Solomon, and God is speaking to him. And the Lord said unto him, in verse 3, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. Now stop for a moment. Here's Solomon's temple. First temple built, built on Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, where the demonic Dome of the Rock stands today. God says it belongs to me and I'm going to put my house there forever. I'm going to put my name forever. I'm going to put my eyes there forever. Look at this. Which thou hast built to put my name there forever, and mine eyes, and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Do you get the idea about what God said about the Temple Mount, which Satan has taken over? God's going to put his eyes there forever. God's going to put his heart there forever. They're going to be there perpetually. God has put his name there forever. Satan always tries to usurp what God has done. Read Isaiah chapter 14, the five great I wills of Satan, where Satan declares that he is going to set himself above the throne of God. He's going to set himself above the stars of God. He is going to be God. Satan cannot originate. Satan can only duplicate, and he does a very shoddy job of duplication. He can usurp, but in the end he loses. God says, this is where I'm putting my eyes and my heart forever. My name is going to be there forever. And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel. How long? Forever. As I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house which is high, every one that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss, and they shall say, Why hath the Lord done this unto this land and to this house? That's what we see today. And they shall answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. Israel has experienced three times being cast out of the land. Twice they have been restored upon repentance and upon the specific timetable set forth by God in Scripture. And we see God even now bringing them back in this third restoration in unbelief, but there is coming a day, and we'll be looking at the text in a few moments, there is coming a day when Israel as a nation will turn to God. It's a three-day period. It's at the end of the tribulation period. We'll see the text that specifically tells us it's going to be three days long in which Israel, as a nation, turns to their Messiah. Hasn't happened yet, but it is coming. And in prelude to that, God is bringing the Jews back to the land. They have no peace. You know what's happening in Israel today with all the rocket attacks that are taking place against it. They do not yet have the peace that is promised, but God is bringing them back to the land, even in the midst of this warfare. And there's going to come a day when, as Paul says, quoting Isaiah, and so shall all Israel be saved. Romans chapter 11, verse 26. So, Jeremiah chapter 25, we see one of the captivities specifically quoted for us as 70 years. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 
and it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation, and I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all nations. Very specific, literal, took place exactly like it said, literally. Seventy years long, Babylonian captivity. We find Deuteronomy talking about how God rejoiced over Israel to do them good, but when they sinned, he would rejoice over them to destroy them. Verse 28, uh, chapter 28, verse 63, It shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and you shall be plucked off from the land, whether thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee. This is the diasporas. That's what it's called, the various scatterings of Israel as a nation. Scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Chapter 30, beginning in verse 1. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before thee, because chapter... 28 and 29 deal with the blessings and the cursings what God says I'll do for you if you obey me this is what's going to happen to you if you don't obey me Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee that thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul Nothing petty about that, nothing haphazard about that, nothing partial about that, nothing lackadaisical about that. All thy heart, all thy soul, that then the Lord God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all nations, whether the Lord God, thy God has scattered thee, if any be driven out into the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. You realize this is what God does. This is not people making decisions for themselves. God says, I'm going to do it. I will make it possible, and then I will irresistibly draw them. That's the kind of sovereign God that we serve, a God that does, not just talks about. A God who moves and doesn't just think. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And that's what brought us to the promise that we began last week, that Israel would be restored to the land upon repentance. Israel will be restored to the land upon repentance. And we looked at the passages in Genesis, in Daniel, Jeremiah, Deuteronomy, and Ezekiel. So today... We come to the covenant of the land, part six. Repentance must come first. They're being pulled back there, but they have not yet repented as a nation. Repentance, a message that is sadly lacking in churches today. Sadly lacking in the preaching of the gospel to the unregenerate and depraved world around us. The easy believism of just, uh, you know, everything will be good and happy and you just sort of smile and wear a Jesus sticker with a smiley face. Dear people, Christ came into the world to save sinners. A man who wants to hang on to his sins will not trust Christ, the Christ of Scripture. They'll trust the smiley face Jesus, but they won't trust the Christ of Scripture. Christ came to save sinners, not so that they can remain in their sin, to save them from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. That was the Christmas message, you remember, that the angel gave to Mary. Repentance, metanoia, is the word that means to turn around 180 degrees and about face. You're going south, you head north. You're going east, you head west. Repentance isn't merely being sorry about your sins. It's a reverse in direction. Repentance isn't merely being sorry that you got caught. Repentance is turning from your sin and turning to Christ. That was the essence of the message of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
It was also the message that Jesus gave after Herod arrested John and killed him. It was the message that Jesus taught the disciples and that they preached. And very few people are preaching it today. You say, well, is it really say that about, you know, John and Jesus and the disciples? Yes. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John is a forerunner. The way that he prepared the way for Christ was the call of repentance. If we would prepare the way for people to come to Christ, we must preach repentance. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Jesus picked up that same message. Did you know that? Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt at Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zabulon and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death his light sprung up. Now listen to verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When, John, when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and then it gives you all this prophecy in between, but here's his message. He heard that John was cast into prison. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What is the message that he's preaching immediately before he calls the disciples? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We go over to Mark. We see the same thing. Here we find it immediately after his time in the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. We get down to chapter 6. A very interesting passage here. Jesus is sending out his disciples, the two by two. He's, he's sending out the 70 here at this point. He called unto him the twelve. And he began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now, what did they preach? It tells you in verse 12. What did they preach? And they went out and preached that men should repent. Folks, this is a confrontation with sin. This is a confrontation with sin. We do not like confrontations here in America. Everything's got to be smooth. You're okay, I'm okay, let's all get along kind of a stuff. When you read the text of the New Testament, it is confrontational on the issue of sin. We're confrontational about our own personal rights. And everybody thinks that's a great idea to do that. Listen, in the New Testament, the believers gave up their own personal rights. They didn't claim their own personal rights. Whether they were confrontational was on the issue that God had told them to be confrontational on, which is the issue of sin. They went out and preached that men should repent. Here's another interesting text out of Luke chapter 13. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, 
whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men which dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You know, that has some very serious implications concerning a bunch of challenges that are made to the gospel today. The first thing is this answers the wrongly worded question, why do bad things happen to good people? I know you've heard that. People throw that up as though that gives them an excuse to continue living in sin. Hey, if bad things happen to good people, hey, it's okay for me to be a bad people. You know, that is the implication of that stupid question. According to Jesus in this text, there are no good people. Except ye repent, you all like was You think these guys got it because they were worse than everybody else? No. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. There are no good people. We are all bad. We all live in a fallen world. We all experience the results of the fall, including natural and man-made disasters and catastrophes. Repentance and faith in Christ is the only way to avoid the eternal consequences of being a fallen people in a fallen creation. Second thing we notice, this call to repentance came before Jesus called his disciples, and then the disciples preached the same message also. This message of repentance is also key to the covenant of the land. God is going to use the great tribulation known as the time of Jacob's trouble to bring national Israel to repentance. Turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 30, a very important passage that relates to the covenant of the land. The book of Jeremiah is filled with incredible prophecies. If you don't study the book of Jeremiah, you're missing an awful lot. Jeremiah chapter 30. Down in verse, well, let's start at the beginning of the chapter, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. By the way, if you want to know about verbal inspiration, here's a verse on it. Write the words that I have spoken. God didn't inspire big ideas. God didn't inspire general concepts. God didn't inspire something sort of vague and fuzzy out there, and you can put it however you want. Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, north and south, saith the Lord. I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel, concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces that are turned into paleness? This is a scary time when the men are like that. Look at verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Oh, read that entire chapter. It's an incredible chapter. It describes how God is going to save Israel out of this great period of tribulation. The time of Jacob's trouble, it's called here. It's called the Great Tribulation in the New Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, that thou shalt call them to mind among the nations. God brings things to our minds. Have you ever been in a situation, you didn't know the answer to the problem, you began to pray about it, and as you prayed and meditated on it, God brought specific verses 
to your mind that you'd study. He doesn't give you new revelation out of the blue. He doesn't all of a sudden plop a verse into your mind that you've never read. That's why you study the scripture. Because God uses his word to give direction. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have on many occasions when I've been stumped. I didn't know where to turn. And as I prayed, God brought scripture to mind that answered the specific problem with which I was faced. God's going to do that with Israel. Thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee out. When God does that, Israel comes to repentance. And as we move farther in the text, it says that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. God brings the word back to their mind. Jews study the Bible today, especially the Orthodox. They memorize it, huge portions of it. Some have the whole Old Testament memorized in Hebrew. I knew some people like that in Israel. But the veil of blindness is on their hearts until that veil is going to be taken away. And God is going to bring it to their mind. And suddenly, as he removes the veil, they will see Christ. And they will repent. And they will turn to the Messiah. That's what God promised them in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Zechariah chapter 12, beginning in verse 8. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God. And the angel of the Lord shall be uh, before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Think about all the nations that are coming against Jerusalem right now. You know what God is going to do to them? You remember our text in Exodus? How God said, after Moses has gone through all this horrible stuff, and Pharaoh keeps turning his back and turning his back, and says, you know, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to, I don't know the Lord. Who is the Lord? You know? And the, the children of Israel have risen up against Moses, and they say, man, we're not going to put up with you anymore. Everything that you've done has only made it worse for us. Our text today says, God said, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. They waited a long time, 400 years, sorrow and pain and labor and bondage and abuse. But finally God said, all right, now that you realize how bad it can be, and now that you've seen how bad Pharaoh is, let me show you how good and how powerful I am. There is coming another day like that for Israel. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Think about all those Hamas terrorists. Think about ISIS. Think about all those different groups out there that hate Israel. God says, I will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Oh, how they love the law. But God says there's coming a day when I will pour out upon them the spirit of grace. Dear friends, if you know Christ, God has already poured out upon you the spirit of of grace. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. This principle that God is going to use the great tribulation to bring Israel to repentance is restated in the New Testament, not only in the Old Testament, it's also in the Gospels and in the Epistles of Paul. Matthew chapter 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Has not happened yet. It's going to happen. Jesus said so. Either Jesus is telling the truth, or he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. Because Jesus said this 
All of it discourse, Matthew chapter 24. This has not happened yet. It's not allegory. It's not spiritualized away. It did not take place in 70 AD when Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem. These things didn't happen. Jesus said they're going to happen. There are those out there who don't believe it. They say, oh, it all happened. The preterists think it's all happened in 70 AD. This has not happened yet. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There's Jesus' opinion on it. It takes place after the tribulation. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And here's Paul quoting Isaiah 59. And so shall all Israel be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Time of Jacob's trouble. <laughs> the name Jacob used, Jacob is the supplanter. Israel in his sin. turn away ungodliness from Jacob. You know what that is? That's what we're talking about, repentance. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That promise is quoted out of Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. Turning from transgression. What is that? That's repentance saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. God's word to Israel stands. It's always going to stand. It will not return unto him void. It will accomplish that which he pleases. It will prosper in the thing whereto he hath sent it. Do you remember what we read last week in uh, the book of Jeremiah? A day is coming when Judah shall be saved. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days... Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That didn't happen at the first coming of Christ. All these other things that we've seen related to future prophecy are coming, and at the second coming of Christ, which takes place at the end of the tribulation, church is raptured before the tribulation, seven years of tribulation, Christ returns to earth and touches down on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, touches down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the tribulation, right before the millennial reign of Christ. In his days, Judah shall be saved, Israel shall dwell in safety. Judah has not yet been saved, Israel is not yet dwelling in safety, but it is coming Back to Romans 11 now. Note the very next verse in Romans 11. For this is, this is verse 27. We, we read up through verse 20, uh, 26 just a moment ago, where it says he'll, the deliverer comes out of Zion, he'll turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27. For this is my covenant to them. Paul is going back to the same promises of the Old Testament that we've been looking at for five and now number six weeks. This is all over the scripture. This is my covenant unto them, not us, when I shall take away their sins. Repentance. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. <laughs> We're the ones that have to repent, not God. God doesn't have to turn and go 180 degrees. Whenever we sin, his face of judgment is toward us. When we repent, God's face of mercy and grace is toward us. Think of two wheels that are touching, two gears that are touching, and you have an arrow that points like this from each one. And you know as those gears turn, those arrows move, don't they? Until they're on the opposite side, and you have two different arrows that are pointing at each other on this side. When man sins, God's judgment is here. As man repents, the gears rotate until they're 180 degrees opposite and you have man's repentance and you have God's grace. 
This is my covenant when I will take away their sins. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Israel as a nation is one of the key illustrations of election and chastening of the elect in the scripture. Look at verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. How God deals with national Israel as an elect group of people gives a visible illustration of how God deals with us as elect individuals. Look at how God deals with Israel as a nation. You'll see how he deals with the elect who are his as individuals. Paul specifically says these things happened as illustrations to teach us. That's why we study the Old Testament even though we're not under the law because those are illustrations for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So he takes them back. Now, these are Gentiles. These are Greeks. These are Greeks living in an awful, horrible city where immorality was rampant. You know about 1 Corinthians. But he takes them back to the Old Testament. He takes them back to the time we're studying in the book of Exodus. He takes them back to the time when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and into the Arabian Peninsula, not the Sinai Peninsula, a place that's about 118 miles wide is where they crossed. A real miracle took place there. They didn't wade through the marshes. They didn't wade through the reed swamp. And Pharaoh's chairs got stuck in the mud. I remember as a child being in a Methodist church, and the Sunday school lesson that day was about the crossing of the Red Sea. And the lesson taught that Moses and the children of Israel, because they were traveling light, they were able to wade through the mud and get across. But the chariots of Pharaoh, because they were so heavy, they sank in the mud and they couldn't catch them. People, that is not what the Bible says. That was being taught, you know, 40, 50 years ago in the Methodist church. You wonder what it's like today. Anyway, where was I? <laughs> okay, 1 Corinthians 10. We were looking at the... Uh, Paul takes these Greeks, a bunch of immoral Greeks, who have come into the church and still living in immorality and sin, and he brings them back to what happened at the crossing of the Red Sea. That's where God took out a people for his name and made them into a nation. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Oh, here's the warning. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Why do you study the Old Testament? It tells you right here. Because the things that happened to Israel in the Old Testament are an example for us of how God deals with his people. They still have promises of the nation, but Paul is warning the Corinthians, a bunch of Greeks, not a bunch of Jews, a bunch of Greeks, that if you want to learn how God deals with his people, what he does when he chastens them, if you want to learn how God deals very seriously about sin, read your Old Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Do you have any question about the fact that God, as he deals with Israel and that group of people, gives a visible illustration? That's what he says here in, in 1 Corinthians 10. In the, New, in the Old Testament, God gives the illustration to us in this age, even though we're not under the law. And verse 12 finishes it off. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Israel is a warning for the church. We cannot get puffed up. We cannot get arrogant. We cannot get proud about what God has done for us because we have the same old sin nature that Israel had. We have the same temptations. We have the same carnal desires. We lust after the same things that Israel lusted after in the wilderness. The things that happened to Israel are given as an example so that we would not fall into the same categories of sins. 
This repentance of Israel as a nation is the principal promise that Paul appeals to in Romans 11 to prove the elective purposes of God. God, Paul says that God sovereignly ordained the temporary fall of Israel. It's only temporary. He did not eliminate them. The temporary fall of Israel so that he could open the door for the Gentiles to be saved. That's why you and I get to be saved. God so worked it that their temporary fall meant that God could open the door for us to the gospel. Paul says that, Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. If you're with us on Sunday evenings in the book of Acts, we see that every place that Paul goes on his missionary journeys, some of the Jews believe and some of them get very, very provoked. They chase him from city to city. They do all kinds of horrible things to him. They raise riots, they stone him, they, you know, they persecute him, they drive him out of the city, they plot to assassinate him. Yeah, provoke them to jealousy. Now, Paul says, verse 12, if the fall of them, that is of Israel, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, because they rejected the Messiah on the first time, the gospel was open to us. That is the riches of the world that's been spread to us. So Paul says, now contrast this. Think about this for a moment. If the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. An even greater blessing is promised to us when they are restored. How much more their fullness for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. Here we are back to what we're talking about in the book of Exodus. We're talking about those diasporas. We're talking about the, the way that Israel has been cast out of the land three times, has been restored twice, and we see movement as God is drawing them from all parts of the world, bringing them back into the land again, still in unbelief. But there's coming a day where they will repent. If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Paul says they will be restored. They're coming back again. For if the first root be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not thyself against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say, here the Gentiles get a little puffy, well, the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Same thing that Paul said to the Corinthians. Here he's saying it to the Romans. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, remember, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Now, back to the illustrations of the Old Testament, what we've just been studying. How God would bless Israel when they were obedient. How God would judge Israel when they sinned. Listen to what Paul says. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. God can put them back in. They were broken off. Oh, oh, and look, I got grafted in. Paul says, don't you understand? God can cut you off too. He can judge you. He can chasten you. He can spank you just as hard as he spanked them. And he can still take them and he's going to do it, because Paul said so earlier, and he's going to graft them back into the root. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, 
be grafted into their own olive tree. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part, not in full, there are Jews today who are being saved, but that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Notice well what the passage is saying. I've said this before, I'll say it again probably many times. The church does not replace Israel. The church does not become Israel. The church is grafted, according to this passage, the church is grafted into the root. And Israel as a nation is going to be re-grafted into the root. When Israel as a nation repents. The church and Israel are two separate branches. Two different branches. Paul says so here in this text. There are two different branches. One got broken off. One got grafted in. But the one that got broken off is going to be regrafted. It doesn't become the other branch. It doesn't take the place of the other branch. There are two different branches that are grafted into the root. And that root is the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26, the next verse. And so shall all Israel be saved, as it is written. And he's been talking about national Israel. He's not been talking about the church. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away in godliness for Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Well, that brings us to the great passage, which we don't have time for today. In the book of Hosea, that tells us that that national repentance is going to take place in three days at the end of the tribulation. Well, that will have to wait until next week. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. It's a blessing to know that you're a God who keeps covenant. A covenant-making, a covenant-keeping God. A God who is not obligated to make covenants, but a God who sovereignly does so because of your love for us. Father, we do not deserve it. Israel did not deserve it. We do not deserve it today. But you cause in your sovereign plan for Israel to be temporarily set aside so that the Gentiles might be brought in and grafted as wild olive branches into the root of the Messiah. And a day is coming when the natural branches will be regrafted into that same root. It's the root that bears us. We do not bear the root. Father, we thank you once again for the great and precious promises of your word. Help us to believe them. Help us to be encouraged by them. Help us to see that the promises of God are true and amen. And then, Father, cause us to live in light of that as witnesses and as testimonies to Jesus Christ because he is the one who has bought us with his blood. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 621, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. Let's stand to sing all the verses of 621.